Okay, I had some lulls this morning working on book number one. I want to make a different video because my last few videos have been about the book and uh, I want to avoid working on the book because avoidance of working on books is how I've written so many books but never finished any. Well, except the ones with Dan. So, uh, but I'm going to do some productive procrastination and make uh, some videos about other things. But I did work on the book today and I uploaded a video about working on the book and I wrote actually some words today and I, you know, oriented myself a little bit. So that's success. I don't have to work on the book again today. I just said I'd make one video a day about writing. So I might just, uh, just think about the ideas and think about what's funny and, you know, think of some funny stories that I want to say. So anyway, I've discharged my obligation. Uh, today, I'm going to make a video. This is, I think, video 21. Really 20, but we'll call it 21. On um, how to make a kilo tube of videos when you know almost nothing about audio or video production. Uh, so when I started making these videos, I really didn't know anything about how to make a YouTube video. I had done some Google Hangouts, and so I had a number of Google Google Hangout series. But that was different than uploading a video to YouTube. And the last Hangout I had made was six years ago. So I just didn't didn't know. Um, and I wanted to do something different anyway. So, so I, I was starting pretty much from scratch in terms of making videos. Uh, although I'd watch a ridiculous amount of YouTube. I'm addicted to Japanese VTubers now, especially from Hollow Live, especially Ozura Subaru-chan. And I've watched so much Day 9 and StarCraft and stuff. It's not even funny. So in some sense, I'm a world-class expert on YouTube videos, watching them, but not on making them. And I was watching a Day 9 video yesterday, and he talked about <clears throat> one of the difficulties. I think it was Day 9. I watched so many videos last night, I got confused. But he was talking about how if you want to do something, if you want to be creative and make something like make YouTube videos that, okay, there's this creative part. There's the making of the video. There's figuring out what your style is going to be. But then there's also a whole bunch of sort of finicky things that are not actually the, at least they don't feel like the creative part. And a lot of people get stuck on the not, not uh, apparently creative part, and then they, you know, just stop. They're just not going to do it. And I felt like stopping a few times when I started making these videos because I was spending heroic amounts of time figuring out how to get my audio to work or trying to edit little clips and figure out some video editing, all those things, you know, screwing around with cameras and figuring out lighting. I spent a whole lot of time doing that with not much to show. Okay, so I think my first two videos, maybe first three videos between them, I think it took me like four or five weeks to make three videos. Uh, and I switched switched microphones. I uh, switched cameras multiple times. I used three different cameras. And, you know, and then for one, for either video two or video three, like I've mentioned, I took, I think, 76 takes once and then threw it all away. And I spent literally days messing around with the audio and audio settings and all that stuff. And it just took a took a while. Um, and it took a while to figure out what sort of microphone do I want? Because I was having some microphone issues and I thought a different microphone setup might solve some of the issues. Um and just, you know, how do you upload a video to YouTube? What are the issues? Um, you know, all of those things. And, and what Day9 was talking about is how a lot of people stop right there. They find it frustrating and say, hey, I, want, I had this great idea for making this cool video talking about whatever. Or I like a video I saw. And so I want to make something kind of like that, but for the things I love. And then you start running into all these technical issues, right? Uh, and And... It was very tempting to just give up at that point. So what I'm going to do is share uh, some things I learned through this process because maybe it'll help someone else. And also, you know, I don't know, maybe it helps just in terms of 
kind of my stumbling and how I went around uh, about this and kind of how I've ended up with what I'm currently doing for my videos in terms of the look and feel and production and, you know, all those things. I'm still figuring it out, obviously. Uh, but if you watched my first or second video versus my more recent videos, you can see that there are a number of changes, especially say from my first video. Um, now, one thing I'll say is the unreasonable effectiveness of doing an absurd number of whatever you're trying to do, that point has really been driven home. You know, there's this famous famous story about a ceramics art class where, you know, one group of students, you know, could make like the one perfect piece and they spent, you know, a long amount of time trying to make one or two pieces. And then another group of students just made a zillion pieces. And then at the end, the question was who made the better pieces? And supposedly it was the group that was just like making pieces, 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 make ceramics, make ceramics, make ceramics, that kind of thing. Right. So, um, uh, and, and that's the same for me for giving talks. Um, I've given so much, so many talks and I have so much public speaking experience because I was a middle school special ed teacher and I did student teaching at the elementary school level and I ran a summer camp. And before that I was a camp counselor and cabin leader and all these things. So I just had to do a lot of public speaking or speaking to small groups or whatever it was before I got into academia, before I started being a teaching assistant in grad school or teaching undergrad courses or, you know, giving professional talks. I just did a lot of that. So at one point I figured I'd done something like 3000, you know, exam, uh, and, and I could tell, like I could tell when I was working with someone else who, who had only given a few talks, um, and, and just for myself, like, you know, I could tell a big difference, especially, when I started giving talks on something like Mini Canron, there was a big difference between my hundredth talk on Mini Canron and my first talk on Mini Canron. It was, you know, huge, huge difference. And that's not to say that I didn't ever give a bad talk. I've given some horrible talks, uh, but that's part of it. I've, I've given enough horrible talks that I know what it's like. I know what, you know, causes of horrible talks often are. And, and I'm still willing to take chances that might result in a horrible talk because I know my next talk will be soon. You know, that's part of it. So um, part of doing an absurd number of things, at least for myself, is I, you know, I learn to keep things simple. And the same thing goes for talks, not just for the YouTube videos, but if I'm giving a talk, I try to keep things simple. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> I was having a discussion with someone on uh, YouTube comments about uh, Emacs and, you know, whether or not I might use org mode or also, you know, should I use Markdown, things like that. And, you know, I'm just using Emacs. And if I want a bullet point, I just do that or do that. You know, I'm not using org mode or anything like that. And to me, org mode is complicated. I've tried using org mode and kind of fumbled over it. I'm using Emacs in the simplest possible way you can imagine probably using 10 commands at most of Emacs, you know, using one one hundredth or one one thousandth of 1% of its capabilities. So even though Emacs is super complicated in some sense, I'm using the simplest version of Emacs. And because Emacs has been around forever, I've used Emacs forever. For me, it's very simple, simple technology. I use it in a simple way. So, so for me, it's keeping it simple. And, um, and also simple is like, you know, you notice I don't, I don't have fancy intros or music or fancy transitions or, you know, any of those things. Um, I'm keeping it as simple as possible. I started playing around with those. If you look at one of my first few videos, I was doing a little bit of that and I quickly dropped it. Partly because I wanted to make lots and lots of videos and I just quickly realized that, you know, I'm going to spend all my time doing these things that I actually don't really care about. You know, part of this is, you don't have to do anything standard or anything like anyone else. So, you know, I, uh, I'm making YouTube videos, but the video is Emacs or the video is, um, the Mac OS desktop, or maybe, you know, some tabs in Firefox. That's it. That's my video. And a lot of the videos are now will radio. Okay, it's just radio. Yeah. Maybe I have an Emacs buffer and I 
go through some points, but that's fine. And, you know, so you don't have to do anything like anyone else. And if you've ever seen any of my talks, uh, you'll notice that when I'm giving a talk, that I certainly take that advice to heart. Neil Gaiman talks about this, and he's got, I think, eight rules for writing you can find online, which are really good. And, you know, the last rule is of the line that, you know, if you do it honestly and, you know, effectively the, the, the best of your ability, you can get away with anything you want in terms of telling your story. Just tell the story the way you need to do it. And there are no other rules. And, you know, he said, so this is, this may be true in life in general, but it's definitely true in writing. So I believe that. So do what you, what you think is necessary. Um, it's okay to not know what you're doing. I certainly don't know what I'm doing. Um, and see the unreasonable effectiveness of doing an absurd amount of whatever you'll learn. So my first video turned out the audio volume was way too low. There's something called, you know, luffs. Um, actually I should talk about luffs here. Let me, let me add something here. I mean, I'll show you, I'll show you exactly. Luffs. And YouTube. All right. So let me add that to the to the things to talk about. That was something I didn't know about. I didn't know what a luff was. And so my first uh, talk that I have, or sorry, my first video, it was super, super low volume, or well, low loudness, technically. Um, and people, you know, kindly put some comments on there. It's like, you might want to do some audio leveling or normalization. I was like, what is that? Okay, well, I have to I'll figure it out. Um, and I did. So the first one, you know, the audio uh, loudness was way too low, but then I figured out what that meant and watched a whole bunch of videos and figured out how to how to change the audio leveling. So now I don't know, I'm not going to say I'm a pro on it, but I can do it. Um, yeah, it's OK to periodically read some comments on your videos or comments on what you're doing or listen to someone, but don't give them too much weight. You know, uh, if you I, I gave that talk the most beautiful program ever written. And before the papers, we love people turned off the comments. Uh, once that video started hitting a couple hundred thousand views, some of the comments in those, uh, in that, <laughs> for that video were not real nice. Uh, I remember the first time I read them, I was taken ba back a little bit. And then I was like, yeah, this is kind of funny. It was like, wow, they really got mad. Um, my clickbait title worked. Okay, I'm definitely going to do a lot more clickbait titles. Okay, clickbait is awesome. They're upset that it's clickbait. I'm going to make a lot more of those. Okay, so that <laughs> became my attitude. But I had to just not worry about it too much. And and when one of my friends is saying, well, maybe you could do this or, you know, that's that's too many videos, I think. Or, you know, like a lot of people have told me too many videos or you're going to burn out or your videos aren't going to be high quality and they're trying to help me. They're trying to keep me from burning out. And I appreciate all that. And I'm not going to listen to them one bit. I love them all. Not going to pay any attention to them because I know what I want to do. And what I want to do involves me making several thousand videos, like 1,024. That's just to get started. Really, I figure I probably need to make about three to 4,000 videos before I have, have any real idea what I'm doing. So... That's, that's the real goal. I almost started with 3,000 this year. I, I, at one point, I calculated I could probably do 10,000 or even 100,000 videos in a year. And I thought about how I how would I do that? They would all have to be like TikTok shorts, you know, 10 seconds, clickbait things. But I, I think I could actually do 100,000 in one year. Um, you know, they'll talk about assembly factory line, you know, 100,000 videos or a, mi a million. Could I make a mega tube? I even came up with a plan for doing one megatube of videos in one year while working full time. You know, I think it's possible. You know, you'd have to make very different videos. And actually, I think it'd be interesting because I'd learn so much. You know, if I made a million YouTube videos in one year, can you imagine like what that would take to, to figure it out? I, I don't know. That, that's you know, not this year, though. This year I'm starting out easy. All right. Make it fun and at least sometimes funny. So, um, my personality is goofy whenever I get too serious about things. I mean, I can be serious and there've been plenty of times in my life I had to be very serious. Um, but my natural personality is playful, playful and curious. And, and, uh, 
and I'm very funny, or at least I think I'm very funny, and some people tell me I'm funny, and other people just groan when I tell jokes. But in my mind, I'm extremely funny, and uh, that should shine through. And so at least I should have fun making these, and I should think I'm funny, which is why the lulls driven development for my first book, uh, I really enjoyed that. So I'm going to do more for the lulls, and I want I want my personality to come through. I think that was a big reason why that talk, the most beautiful uh, program ever written, why people like that talk was my personality really came through. I was I had a hot crowd, I had a warm up act. Probably people were drunk. I don't know. I think there was alcohol. There was like certainly free pizza, right? And everyone was just like in a great mood. And I told my first joke and everyone was laughing. And I was like, okay, I'm going to kill it. <laughs> you know, it was, it was just, it was exactly like stand up comedy. I've got a hot crowd. They're laughing at everything I do. You know, I'm just going to go for it. So um, that was special. Now, there are a lot of crowds I've had that were not hot crowds, they were the opposite. Uh, but that one was special. And then uh, so something I've learned. You know, from my first or second or third video, a couple people or one person, I have to look up who it was. Someone said, hey, you know, it'd be great to have a forum to talk about things. And then someone suggests a Discord. And I thought, huh, okay. Well, I've done Discord a little bit for gaming and I know their Discord servers. I've been part of one or two, but I don't really know anything about it. So uh, set up a Discord and... So far, it's been surprisingly fun and surprisingly funny. I guess it's like, a, you know, it's the milkshake that brings all the nerds to the yard. I don't know. Um, but it's like we've got our own little group, and now I've joined Discords for other groups of friends I have. So it seems like a lot of people have Discords, and a lot of communities have Discords. Uh, so I guess that's the great thing is that, you know, friends have said, hey, you could join my Discord if you want. Um, so that's just That's just neat. And uh, even though the Discord that I started is obviously, you know, oriented around these videos to some extent, I don't think it's really about that because there are a lot of discussions about like retro computing and music and things like that. Programming languages, people talking about all sorts of things I don't know about. Um, so it's more like, you know, that's why I call it the stone soup. You know, I'm I am making videos that are ostensibly about programming languages, although some of them... <laughs> It was probably tenuous. And then, you know, here's a forum that's supposedly talking about my videos, but not really. There's not a whole lot of talking about my videos. On the, the, you know, so like we're talking about topics I find interesting, but people who are watching these videos probably share interests, otherwise they wouldn't be watching these, right? So, you know, that um, that's actually been really fun. You know, I kind of feel like at some point I could just like stop making videos and no one on Discord would notice. I think probably need a little more, uh, a little more action on the Discord before we could get to that point. But it does feel like the stone soup type thing. So that's been fun. That's been something I, I enjoyed. Anyway, let's get into sort of the more technical things. Um, all right, audio. Let's talk about audio. I really care about audio. So this is something I've learned from giving talks giving a lot of talks and listening to a lot of talks and also listening to lots of videos. And my, my thesis, I, I don't, I don't know that this is even controversial. It's definitely the case for me though. And, you know, humans seem far more sensitive to problems with the audio than to visual problems. So if I'm listening to a video or if I'm, if I'm uh, watching a talk and there are AV problems, there's feedback, there's static, um, changes in volume, if the person's voice is cutting in or out, all those sorts of things, you know, that's, or there's a bunch of plosives, the, like the, the puff sounds, the, the, you know, the air sound when they say P, P, pet, pet, pen, you know, pen, that's the famous one in Japan for English pen. Uh, when you hear those noises, at least when I do, I just can't stand it. It's like fingernails on the chalkboard. You know, that kind of thing. Notice fingernails on chalkboard. That's an audio, you know, that's an um, that's something with the hearing, right? So that, that really can turn people off. And if I'm watching a video, like I was watching a Richard Feynman talk that was recorded, 
you know, a long time ago, and you couldn't really see uh, his projections, his project, projected slides, but the audio was okay. And it's like, fine, I can listen to that. You know, that's just like listening to a, to radio or tape recording or whatever. So, so that's no problem, you know. So there's like Mitch Hedberg's joke about elevator temporarily stairs. That's how I feel. Like, it's like, okay, YouTube video temporarily radio, okay? If the, if the, if the video isn't great, we'll just close your eyes or you know, go do something else and listen to it. It's suddenly radio. That's, you know, there are lots of podcasts that became very popular. Radio is great because you can do things um, while just listening. So, uh, but the point is you better get the audio part right. So if you mess up the video or it's low res or whatever, eh, probably not so bad. But if you mess up the audio, forget it. Your video could be perfect. It's a real problem. And I think this, this is very true of talks as well. Although people mess up their visuals and talks a, a lot. I'm, I'm going to definitely do some videos about common mistakes in talks. In fact, I might make a, make a, <laughs> create a book on it because I, I get so angry and frustrated when I see the same exact mistakes made by every graduate student and half of professors and, oh man, uh, that really lights me up. Anyway, let's talk about types of microphones. So once again, these are things I've had to learn. Had to learn. So uh, condenser microphones, dynamic microphones, ribbon microphones. Okay. So, oh yeah, we're going to look at this in a minute. We're going to look at this in a minute. That's some special software. Uh, but we're not going to look at it yet. Instead, we're going to look at web browser. Okay, so we're going to talk about condenser microphones, dynamic microphones, other types of microphones. When I start, okay, so first of all, I'm recording this on a laptop. The laptop has a built-in microphone. I'm assuming it's a dynamic microphone. I don't know. Um, it's okay for doing a Zoom call or whatever. Um, you know, and, and Zoom software got pretty good you know, signal processing to re remove background noises and so forth. So you can make yourself heard. Uh, but the microphone's not great for recording videos if you really care about the audio quality for a few reasons. Uh, one reason is it tends to pick up fan noise. You know, right now my fans are on. I don't know if you can hear it, but, you know, I, I definitely can pick it up with my you know, if I, if I accidentally record a video like this with my built-in laptop mic, which I have multiple times as a failure mode I've, I've learned to avoid, um, you know, you can instantly tell. You can instantly tell. It sounds like I'm recording in a tunnel or something. Uh, also, I'm in an untreated room. So treating a room is, you know, when you would put up sound-absorbing material like drapery or acoustic foam or, you know, there are all sorts of ways you can treat a room, but I'm not in a treated room. So I've got bare walls here and the sound bounces off. And if I record with my laptop, you pick it up. You pick up lots and lots of echo from the room acoustics and it doesn't, doesn't sound very, very good. Also, you just pick up a lot of background noise, not just the fan noise, but if I bump the desk or anything like that, or bump the laptop, if I'm typing, pick that up a lot. Anything touching the laptop you can pick up and just traffic, people talking. Yeah. But, you know, anyway, just, just the fan noise and the echo is already like bad. It's quite bad. Uh, unusable, I think, if you're trying to record something with decent size uh, sound. So, you know, unless you're doing a Zoom call or something like that, I think you want an external microphone. Now, the microphone that I started out with, which a lot of people um, have you know, bought, maybe it's less popular now, but certainly for a time there was the Yeti blue microphone and there was the Yeti snowball. So this company Yeti had, or it was a company blue, sorry, it was blue Yeti and blue snowball. There was a company called blue that made these, um, what are called, uh, condenser microphones. Okay. So this is a condenser microphone and this thing looks like it's built out of a tank. It's like all aluminum and, uh, it, it is pretty sturdy. Um, except for one thing, which is the connector underneath 
is a horrible USB B micro connector, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And that thing sucks. And I don't know why they, they still make these mics uh, with that connector, but, it, but it's terrible. And I've destroyed at least one of these Yetis, which is built like a tank because I accidentally left in the, well, I mean, I didn't think about it, but I left the cable in and uh, somehow I pulled on that cord and bent the USB um, USB B micro connector um, and basically destroyed that micro microphone. So these connectors can be fragile. So even though the thing's built like a tank, you really do have to be careful with the connector. Uh, so anyway, this is a fine microphone. You know, a lot of people think it's overpriced. Maybe it is, probably it is. Uh, but you have different patterns and all sorts of things I never really understood. That's a fine mic. Uh, it's a condenser microphone. So condenser is like the British term for capacitor. Uh, it's an active mic. So, so there's, um, you know, there's some sort of amplification happening with the microphone itself. And I don't understand the physics of it. But the point is you get a very nice, strong, loud signal from this sort of microphone. And it's great. If you are in a treated room or in an area with low noise, it's fantastic. The downside of this type of microphone is it picks up everything. There's a dog barking a block away. People are doing, you know, construction work three houses down. You can hear the saw or there's a truck driving down the road or, or you, know, you can hear people talking or someone, you know, anything. You just pick all that stuff up. Uh, and echo in the room, all those things. So in, in my experience, this sort of microphone is way sensitive, uh, way too sensitive. I mean, you could put the microphone across the room and still pick it up, still pick things up. Um, so there's nothing wrong with, with this as a microphone, and there are certain environments in which it works really well. What I found was if I was in any sort of noisy environment, I just couldn't make a long video because uh, it, because it picked so much up, I was constantly having to record little clips. And I remember when I was in Birmingham, Alabama, I lived on a busy street. It's like one of the maiden drags off the highway. It was near the main hospital. There was, you know, helicopters flying in, you know, uh, life flight medevac things. There were ambulances, fire departments. There were biker groups that would love driving down at 2 a.m. at night and revving their engines in front of my, my, uh, um, you know, apartment complex as a as a 2 a.m. salute, all those sorts of things. And I, I tried recording a five minute talk once at night, and I couldn't record more than 10 or 15 seconds of audio before something interrupted it. And it took me hours to record the five-minute talk, even when I knew what I was talking about. Five-minute talk, by the way, I think is not easy to do. The shorter the talk, the, the tighter it has to be. So the one-minute talk would be really hard. But I found that almost impossible to deal with. Uh, so that was a real problem. And then after COVID happened and I was living with my parents, I was asked to record some videos for FOSDEM, like the free and open source uh, developer conference. And that at the time was remote. And so I recorded, I tried recording some videos and I ran into the same thing. I and mean, it was, it was intolerable. Um, people were doing construction next door. You know, I couldn't, couldn't record at all because there was like some sort of power saw going I just couldn't, you know, maybe if I knew how, something about audio processing and the settings and everything, but forget that. Remember, we're going, we want simple, okay? We don't want to have to do post-processing and filtering and all that stuff to just get a decent signal in there if we can avoid it. We want to keep it simple. So that's a condenser mic. If you're in a quiet area, you've got, you know, a room that has good acoustics, perfectly fine. If you're in a studio, perfectly fine. Um, but, you know, actually in studio, I don't think they tend to use condenser mics uh, for audio, but I don't know. I'm not a studio engineer, obviously. Um, I think in a studio, a lot of times they're going to use dynamic mics, but there are a whole bunch of different types of mics. There are like ribbon mics, there's an old style mic. I don't know 
much about mics. You can find a zillion YouTubes about different types of microphones. My only interest in this video is talking about what I found worked for me over time. Now, the most famous dynamic mic is the Shure SM58 uh, vocal microphone. If you've ever given a talk, you know, in, in like a public auditorium or on a stage or sung on a stage, there's a very good chance that you have used one of these microphones. Or if you've been to a music performance, there's a very good chance there was at least one uh, Shure SM58. This is the most powerful, I mean, sorry, most, it's the most powerful microphone ever made. It's the most uh, common or most popular dynamic mic. And it's a very old design. Um, and it's like military spec, right? So this thing's like indestructible. Uh, so this this is a super famous mic. And I know of at least one YouTuber who makes the videos holding this mic. Um, now this mic uses a type of connector called an XLR connector, okay? XLR connector. And the XLR cables are, uh, let's see, somewhere I got an XLR cable. Where do we have? No, that's not it. There, no, no. There we go, there's an XLR cable. So this is an XLR cable. And this is what musicians would use for their their equipment. So like the roadies setting things up. And, uh, you know, this is industrial strength, you know, uh, can take lots of abuse on a tour for years type, type cable. And it's got good sound quality. So this is like the gold standard for audio equipment, at least for what you would see in live performance. Um, yeah, so this is a great microphone. Now, people tend to either hold it or it's on this sort of mic stand. Um, and and for the dynamic microphone, the dynamic microphone is different from the condenser microphone. Is that you know they're really intended to be talking right into uh, the microphone. In fact, a lot of people will put the microphone on maybe their bottom lip or on their on their chin. You know, it's like right there. And so the great thing about it is, um, you know, it, it's not going to pick up a lot of noise from things further away. Uh, the one of the compromises or trade offs is that if you're if you're away from the mic, it's not going to pick it up very well. So, you know, right now with the microphone I'm using, which I'll show you in a minute, I'm I'm almost eating the microphone, eating the mic. They say right, like my mouth is almost on the microphone because I have to be really really close. Um, but that also means that even if there is background noise, like, you know, I'm on a street and you can hear cars going by and trucks going by, my fans are on right now. If I'm right next to the mic and I'm talking at a decent level, you know, hopefully those other sounds are picked up much less. So it's not like you won't ever hear a, a background sound, but it will be different than, than with a standard condenser mic, at least with standard settings, at least. That's my understanding based on my, you know, under, uh, you know, modicum of knowledge. I will say that I, I guess Logitech bought Blue. Okay. There are now, especially since so many people do podcasting and YouTube and whatever, um, there are, uh, you know, Yeti, Caster, and there, they have dynamic mics here. Active Dynamic XLR. I don't know what Active Dynamic is. Um, but anyway, they have a whole bunch of other type of of microphones now. I don't know. I, that just looks like a Yeti. Uh, maybe that's a condenser. But they, they do have some sort of, I guess, dynamic mic. I don't know what an Active Dynamic mic is. Anyway, these things exist. There's a whole bunch of companies that make these. Well, you can check it out. But the, the main thing is, is a condenser or dynamic. Um, the most famous dynamic mic right now for podcasting and YouTube is this Shure SM7B. So Shure is you know one of the the leaders if not the leader in dynamic mics, probably the the most popular brand. Um and this is what you would see for like the really high-end podcasts and YouTubers. They almost all use this this microphone. This microphone's you know not cheap. It's definitely more expensive than, say, a Yeti. 
Um, and it's pretty big. Uh, and also, you know, this is an XLR only microphone and the XLR stuff, you know, here's, here's the connector, you know, the XR, XLR cables are bigger. Um, you know, you need what's called an interface to, con you can't plug in an XLR mic directly to your laptop. There's no XLR, you know, connector. So you need what's called an interface. Um, and in fact, with this one, you also need really um, like a preamp on it. So unlike a condenser mic, which is active and has, um, you know, basically active gain going on with, you know, the condenser, a dynamic mic is passive. So I don't know what Yeti means or what, what they mean here by a, an active um, dynamic mic. I'm probably wrong about some of the details, but the basic idea is the dynamic mics are much uh, quieter than the condenser mics, They're just like by the design. That's the design of the microphone. It is much quieter. So you need amplification in addition to the microphone. And so for a Shure SM7B, that's great if you get into more of the audio production and you have additional equipment. But, you know, the $400 to get this, that's more like the down payment. That's like the, the entry to just get the microphone. But you're going to need more stuff. So it's it's going to be you know, closer probably to $1,000 to get into this. So um, there's something called the Cloud Lifter, which became standard. So that was sort of like a preamp that you would put on on the Shure SMB. And then the person who did the Cloud Lifter started working with Shure, and they have a an SM7DB, which has uh, that basically a cloud lifter type thing built into it. So so if you get this version, which is $100 more, you don't have to get the cloud lifter. Okay. Um, that's that's still an XLR microphone. And so it takes these special connectors. And you need, like I said, you need what's called this uh, an interface. So here's an interface. Uh, so you plug in and then you plug in, you know, this, the sort of control panel amplifier setup, control that into your, you know, plug it into your laptop or whatever. So the nice thing about this is you've got nice controls. You have real physical controls. You can have multiple mics. So, you know, there, there's actual high quality amplification going on. So that's, that's good. You have a lot of control over that. Um, you know, there, there's also this sort of audio interface where you plug into the XLR, I guess, and then you get a USB-C out, uh, the back end. Okay, so there are various ways to do it. The microphone I now have is uh, what's called an MV7. That's a Shure MV7. So this is intended to be like a podcast microphone. And so it's it's a nice microphone. It's cheaper than, than the, uh, you know, the either the SM7B or the SM7DB. It's cheaper than either one of those. Um, and it does have an XLR connector on the back. If, yeah, so it's got an XLR, uh, XLR connector on the back. So if you want to, you can treat it like, you know, sort of the the higher end mic and get get the cloud lifter and get the interface and all that and go XLR. So that's sort of the upgrade route. Um, but it's really intended to be a USB mic, or at least you start out as a USB mic and then maybe you upgrade. So I'm using this as a USB mic. And and supposedly this is the best sounding USB mic on the market. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what mic to get. Uh, the other thing is that this mic is fairly small. I don't know if you can tell, but the form factor is just like shorter. It's significantly smaller. And I wanted to be able to take the mic when I'm traveling uh, and this mic, when I started looking at it, it's like, wow, that's going to, between this and the interface and the cables and the cloud lifter and everything, this is going to take up half of a suitcase at least, maybe most of a suitcase, if I can even fit it in. And, you know, just the travel case, if you want to get like the hardback travel case, the hardback travel case for this is like 200 bucks. So, you know, you could easily get into like full audio production, which I don't want to get into right now. I want to make videos. So... This is, I think, a pretty good compromise. 
There's some other podcast microphones like Rode, I think has one now that's supposed to be good. Uh, and I'm sure this is changing, but this, this one for me seems to work quite well. And I, I like the fact this got this both small. So like I can easily fit this in this box in my suitcase uh, and have room left over. And also, you know, there is this upgrade path if I want to do XLR later. So that's nice. Now this infamous uh, USB B micro. Okay. So one thing I will say, and that people have criticized about the MV7 is it is a USB mic, but it's got this USB B micro um, connector on it. Same as the Yeti. And these things suck. Okay. So, uh, they're kind of finicky. You got to put it in exactly right. And they're easy. In my experience, they're easily bent. And I don't want to have to take my mic apart and replace connectors. Uh, one of the problems I've had, I, I had originally a cheaper uh, dynamic mic from Audio Technics. Uh, there's like a Amazon bundle with an Audio Technics dynamic mic and a little arm that goes with it. Uh, that's cheaper than this. And, but I found that with that mic, the cable that came with it, it seemed kind of unreliable, at least the cable on the arm and it would cut in and out. So I, I just like don't want to mess with that sort of thing. And so, so I'm worried about this connector. So I'm very careful to not put any strain on it. Um, you know, so that, that easily could take out this mic. Uh, so the XLR, that thing's built like a tank, you know, you're not going to have a problem with the XLR connector. Um, so anyway, but I guess if the if the USB breaks, you still have at least the XLR option. In any case, that connector is not great. Now, another thing you need is some way, you know, I mean, the, the microphone doesn't come with a real stand. It's got like a little tripod that it comes with. And the same with the... Audio Technics one. It came with a little sucky tripod. The one with the the Shure MV7, the tripod's a little better. But what I found is, first of all, if I, you know, because your mouth has to be right next to the thing, if I'm trying to type, that means I got to put the the mic between my keyboard and my and myself, like on the table. And so I either got to shove my my um, laptop all the way back, you know, which is kind of uncomfortable. Uh, or it's just in the way. The other thing is if you bump the tripod, you know, it might fall over. You're going to pick up sound. And if you bump the desk, you know, the tripod's on the desk. So you'll pick up sound and it, it it's finicky. I just don't like it. So instead, what most people do, is they put the mic on an arm. Um, and so I did have the one that came with the Audio Technics bundle from Amazon it was okay, and I recorded the Fosdom videos. Um, it was enough to get me started and to learn what a dynamic mic was and what a what an um, you know versus a condenser mic and you know play around with it a little bit. But it was really a starter kit. It wasn't something that I would want to use a lot because there are things like the springs in the arm. You know, these arms have springs in them, so the spring in the cheap arm you could hear the spring. So if you ever touched it, you would pick up spring noises. And also it was very lightly made. So, um, you know, it just wasn't made with high quality. So the mic was always drooping down or the arm was drooping down and I had to like duct tape the mic and it just, it was finicky, okay? And I spent a lot of time messing with the arm or messing with the mic position to get it to work. Uh, and I didn't like that. So in addition to the MV7, I got this PSA1 Plus. Notice the Plus, because there's also a PSA1 arm from Rode. And Rode also makes microphones. They make they make good stuff, at least so far, maybe. <laughs> maybe they'll, you know, all these companies at some point might go downhill. Who knows? But right now, uh, they make good stuff. And you could get, you know, their, their dynamic mics work fine. Um, but this is the arm I got. The, the the PSA one plus and I forget how much this cost um, you know it costs a little bit and this arm's pretty big and it's it's built way better than the arm that I got from that cheap Amazon package 
um, these arms are weighted, or sorry, are rated for a certain amount of weight. Okay, so that's important to think about. So if you get a really big, heavy microphone, especially if you get pop filters and, you know, isolation, you know, uh, the, their vibration isolation things that you can add on, uh, you know, those all add weight. And so you just have to be careful that your entire package isn't more than the arm is weighted for. Otherwise, it won't be able to stay, you know, keep its position. Uh, but, you know, for my, for the MV7, and I also have like a little, you know, kind of like one of these vibration isolation disc thingies. So this is kind of like a bungee cord um, to just isolate it. So if I hit my desk, you know, the vibration's not going to get picked up. Uh, so I've got, I got the MV7 with that little vibration disc um, and on the arm. And the arm seems to handle just fine and extends really well. So I, I like this arm a lot and I like the mic a lot. Um, so that's a, that's a good setup. I just don't have to worry about them anymore. That's the main thing. I just want, like like I said, simple. Simple and reliable. I just don't want to worry about it. Okay, so that's my philosophy. And I'm sure there are all sorts of other things I could do and could probably improve the sound quality and whatever. But I don't think that's the problem I have with my videos. It's not the sound quality at this point. It was in the beginning. But I think that's not the problem. Another thing about the MV7 I found out is that you can actually put on the windscreen from the Shure SM7B. Um, it's a much longer windscreen, has more of the material. And so this windscreen, you know, if you're outdoors, it's to protect from wind, but indoors was really about is protecting against plosives with like the pen sound, the puh, that puff of air. Uh, so there's a, a smaller one of these that comes with the MV7, but it doesn't have that much material in it. So an upgrade that a lot of people suggest is if you're going to get an MV7, first of all, get a decent arm like the one I showed you. Get one of these bungee isolation disc thingies and also upgrade to the windscreen from the M, uh, the 7B. All right. Now, why they shipped with the uh, windscreen that's not as good, I don't know. I guess this price. Um, and it's also a little easier to move. But... I have this big windscreen on it and I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to have to duct tape it on or something. Well, I don't because I just have my microphone at an angle point, pointing slightly up anyway. So it just doesn't fall off because of gravity. So anyway, I didn't, didn't have to mess around with that. So that's nice. That's a nice upgrade. Um, all right. So that's all of that. Okay. And I, I want to talk a little bit about, okay, so that's audio. All right. All right, that's audio. So let's talk about. Okay, they're, they're also the form factors. Okay, I'll talk about um, a little more for audio. So you can hold an audio, a microphone in your hand, like the was the SM58 that I showed you, right? Um, you know, you can hold that in your hand. I know a YouTuber who has guitar videos who holds it in his hand when he's making things. Well, of course, you got something in your hand now, but. Uh, that, that works just fine. And musicians have been using that microphone for decades. You can have a headset. So a lot of people have a headset mic. Um, I, I don't, don't have a lot of experience other than if you're going to get a headset mic, you probably want to really look into it and make sure that, that you've got one that sounds good. I've, I've seen people and I've bought some really cheap headset mics and they were terrible. They, they really were terrible. The audio sounded terrible. The good thing about a headset mic is the mic is the same distance from your mouth. So you can turn around and look different ways. And uh, and then you can have the headphones built in so you can hear yourself if you want. By the way, you know the nice microphones or the, the interfaces, they also have a, a monitor so you can plug in head, headphones to hear yourself. I don't listen to that because I don't like hearing myself. I, I think it pulls me out. I don't like hearing myself and I don't like seeing myself. And I remember the first time I gave a talk where I was, <laughs> there was like a PA system and I could hear my echo coming back after a few milliseconds. And then, wow, that freaked me out. In fact, I said, I'm not using the mic the first time. I, I eventually got used to it, but I still don't like it. Um, okay, so the headset mics, there are clip-on clip mics that there's, I think maybe Rode has one. Uh, it looks like, I don't know, it looks like an old pager or something like that. And it just like clips onto the front of your shirt. 
um, then you can walk around. It's all wireless. So that that seems to work okay. Uh, the mic's not that close to your mouth, so it's probably not the same qual sound quality as if uh, you were talking right into a, a dynamic mic. But if you want to walk around, that seems to work really well. The lavalier mics, I probably spelled that wrong, where, where you know, you know that's, that's like the old style clips onto your lapel of your shirt where the mic's tiny and then you thread that wire to the little clip-on box in your back pocket or whatever. So there are those as well. Um, I will say if you're going to do this sort of mic or the or the maybe the clip-on, but certainly with the lavalier mic, especially for a public talk, you have to be really careful because it's very, very easy for that microphone to rub against uh, your clothing or if you have a jacket or whatever, or it can get unclipped. Uh, I find those very finicky, so I don't particularly like those. Um, and the, the, there's the desk, the tripod thing, which I talked about. Um, I don't like the tripod approach just for the reasons I talked about. The boom arm, that's sort of standard for the high end, you know, podcasters. That That is what I like so far. And even with the boom, there are different ways to do it. So you can either have the microphone above the arm or the microphone hanging down below the arm. Uh, I have the mic hanging down below my arm. A lot of podcasters or YouTubers like the mic above the arm so the arm is out of their video or at the bottom of the video so the arm's not in their way. Uh, for at least my setup, I don't want the arm in the way of typing and that sort of thing. Uh, but you can set it up different ways. There are a zillion vi videos on these things it's, uh, they are kind of helpful. And then you just watch what people do. All right. Uh, other issues to consider with audio. So there are these mouth noises. And I picked them up a lot with that previous Audio Technica mic, which is a decent mic, but it didn't have a windscreen on it. Um, and what I started noticing when I list to, listened to my audio was that it picked up all sorts of mouth noises, all the plosives, the syllabants, like snake, snake, that's a syllabant, plosives like pen, all that stuff it picked up, kind of annoying. And the clicks, my mouth clicks, you know, your mouth opening, your tongue, a dynamic mic right next to your mouth, if you're eating the mic, pick up all that stuff. So that's one reason the longer windscreen for... Uh, putting the longer windscreen on the MV7 helps with that extra material. It helps cut down on that. And it's not perfect, but cuts down on it. Uh, background noise, fan noise, um, cars going by, people talking, all that. Bumping the mic. That's one reason you want a bungee setup, holding your mic on a long arm, if possible, that sort of thing. Uh, moving the boom arm itself can make noise, or moving the mic can make noise, even if you have it on a boom typing noise, you know, all those sorts of things. And one of the things I'll say is I've tried using software to remove these sorts of noises. Uh, so in Audacity, for example, there's a filter that will remove the noise of a fan and it works, but it also messes with your voice. And if you're not careful and you add all these compressors and noise suppressors and filters, you can end up sort of sounding like a robot. So uh, I didn't do that. I want to keep it simple. Uh, another issue is electromagnetic interference. And I think with dynamic mics, they're especially susceptible to this. So I was recording the first couple of videos in you know, my room in my parents' house. And uh, you know I, I was using the Audio-Technica mic and I was getting this horrible buzzing sound when I tried to amplify it to, you know, for, for the YouTube videos. And I thought, wow, is there something wrong with the mic? But it doesn't seem to be like that when I record it on with the laptop speaker. And then I recorded it in the kitchen and I didn't hear the buzz. What's going on? So I asked my friend Cam, who's the ultimate gearhead. And he said, well, you know, these things could be happening. Turn off your lights, do all this. It took me a couple of days, but then finally I did turn off the lights, and it turned out there was this US uh, there was an LED floor lamp. I had two of the exactly the same model, but for one of them, I don't know if it was the lamp or there was like a little wall wart, I suspect was the problem. 
Um, but if I had that lamp on, all you could hear was this buzz. So that was enough. And, and it was interesting in that if you turn the microphone at a 90 degree angle, you know, the buzz would go away and if you point a different direction. So basically the microphone was acting like a little antenna and picking up the electromagnetic waves. Um, so that was really annoying. So I had to not have that light on. Um, so it took me a while to figure out. And and when I bought the new mic and set it up, it's like the same buzz was there. It's like, okay, it's definitely not the mic. It definitely is that um, lamp. So electronics, lamps, the you know wiring in the wall, all of those can cause problems, especially with the dynamic mic. So I had to learn about that. All right, on to video. Video also... Uh, there's an awful lot to learn. Lighting, resolution, camera lenses, focal lengths, apertures. You get a you know digital uh, single lens reflex camera. You know what resolution are you using? What's the background going to be like? All that stuff. You know what are you going to wear? Do you wear makeup? And what angle? How the lighting works? Do you have a key light? Hmm. There was a period of time when I was trying to learn all that stuff. And I started trying to do it again here. Uh, and then eventually I got disgusted with it. And so this is partly it's just keep things simple. Partly it's because I want to be able to make a lot of videos. And I realized that, you know, if I have my microphone set up um, and I'm recording my screen, it doesn't matter. You can't even tell where I am. I could, I could be right now in a hotel room and you wouldn't know. But if I am recording video, you can tell if it's day or night. I was trying to record videos and you could tell that, oh, I recorded this scene at night and then this scene at day and this scene at night. You know, it just, all, things like that started to become of concern to me. And also, you know, I had different resolution cameras, but the camera, the Color quality wasn't great. They weren't really nice cameras. So I had a camera that was, you know, supposedly HD or 4K or, and, or 1080p, uh, different cameras. Uh, and none of them looked great. They, they weren't great. The other thing is it just took a lot of horsepower from my computer to process that video. And, and I was using uh, OBS, which I'll talk about in a minute. And when I was recording the video, the fan noise was so loud. The fans were just, I mean, it sounded like my laptop was about to melt. That first of all, my mic was picking up the fan noise, even with the dynamic mic. And secondly, um, the fan noise was so loud, it distracted me. I had trouble listening, you know, just talking because the fan noise, you know, sounded like a typhoon or something. So uh, I backed off of that. And then the other thing is, if I'm watching myself, which is what was happening when I was recording. Oh, I got to make sure I'm in the, the camera at the right angle. First of all, with, with a lot of these cameras, they'll pick up like any imperfection in your skin or it's like, oh man, what's that on my face? You know, do I need to, to get a skin check? Um, all that sort of thing. And uh, wow, I'm looking old today, or I guess I always look old, or I'm looking overweight, all those sorts of things. But then beyond that, there is the, there's kind of mental bandwidth. Um, I find that when I'm looking at people's faces, it, I don't really think about it, but it requires some processing capacity. Uh, some of my friends have pointed out that if we're having a conversation and they ask me something that requires me to think really hard, I actually will turn away from them and face a blank wall. I'll just stare at the wall like a couple inches away and think about it. And then I'll turn back to them and answer. And the reason is if I'm looking at faces and I'm, uh, there's a lot of visual actions, but especially faces, I don't know. I just, I, I can't think as well. I think this is true in general for a lot of people. There's many famous People will do good thinking in the shower or they'll close their eyes, that kind of thing. Um, you know, trying to get away from a computer. So reducing the amount of stimulation helps. But for me, anytime I'm looking at faces, especially my own face, uh, sort of my my eyes are drawn to my face and I'm, I'm kind of like staring at myself. It's like uh, staring at my reflection in the water or, 
or uh, something like that. So I really uh, get disturbed by that. I'm not really disturbed, but I just like can't. It takes up uh, some of my CPU. And also, I just want to keep it simple. I don't want to deal with any of that stuff. I just want to make make videos, and you know, I, it's it's sort of irrelevant. You know, I think you can tell what my mental state or my emotional state is if I'm excited or not just from my voice. So that's my style. Keep it simple. And partly it's just because I don't, I want to make a lot of videos. I just want to make a lot of videos. And I'm also just less self-conscious of myself if it's just me talking. You know, sounds like I'm just talking to myself, you know, no problem. Uh, as soon as the video starts getting in there, it's just, it's starting to become like a real production. So, you know, instead I'm doing screen recording and the screen recording has Emacs, the Mac OS desktop and Firefox, the trifecta. That's it. That's what I have settled on. And, you know, that's fine. That's the sort of thing, thing I like anyway. Uh, people have asked, well, could you use org mode for Emacs or Markdown or things like that? Org mode's way too complicated. Way too complicated. I really like keeping it super, super simple. Even Markdown's maybe too complicated. Um, maybe it's okay for the book, but I just want to strip it down to the very, very basics. Okay. Really, really simple. Um, yeah. And so I'm not, not doing any editing. I'm not putting intros or, um, explicit transitions or any of that stuff, partly because I want to do minimum editing because I want to make a lot of videos. And I started calculating how long it would take me to edit these videos. It's like, okay, that's, you're getting into like a week or more. 24 hours a day if I spent like a week to do that sort of editing um, this year. And I, I just don't want to do it. And I, I just don't care. It's not interesting to me. So I just do it my own way. I'm really minimalist. So I'm not doing any of that. I'm trying to do things in one take. And that's something I want to do anyway. I don't want to do 76 takes. I don't want to be, you know, a director uh, like a Stanley Kubrick that has to film someone walking through a door 50 times, you know, I, I refuse. Uh, and also I'm just trying to train myself to be able to do things in one take. I think it's better personally. Minimum editing. The only editing I'm doing right now is to level the audio. I'll show you that. Uh, Alex Miller made an interesting observation about my use of Emacs for the editing like that, or for outlining like this, like for this video. You know, I was doing it just to give myself sort of teleprompter type thing and, and to organize my thoughts. But what Alex pointed out was if you're watching one of my videos and I'm famously long winded, if you want to get to a certain point where well, you can just scrub, scrub the video until you see that I'm, you know, talking about something of interest um, and then stop there. So he, he called it surprisingly awesome, I believe. Uh, so, you know, that wasn't intentional, but that's a, a happy accident, as Bob Ross would say. And, you know, style emerges from these sorts of choices. That's one of the things I realize. I'm starting to develop a style, just like my talks have a certain style. You know, if you see one of my talks, probably there's going to be Emacs, you know, sitting there waiting to happen. Uh, I don't give a lot of slide talks. Occasionally I will, but I don't, don't do it very often. Okay, let's talk about software. Um... A lot of people use software called OBS. Uh, it's, I think it's free software or free or open source software. Um, I don't know what the exact licensing is, but that's what most of you know the the casters use. People streaming on Twitch, uh, the game players like Day Nine, whatever, and and it's very powerful and allows you to have multiple camera inputs and you know the desktop and a camera facing you and a camera facing something else and you can do all sorts of effects and it's, it's like, a, it's just really amazing. Um, on my laptop, I've got an Intel MacBook Pro with 64 gigs of RAM and, you know, it's a, a ridiculously powerful version of, of the MacBook Pro before they, they went to Apple Silicon. Um, if I even look at OBS, it, you know, pegs my CPU cores and uh, the fans kick on. So I was getting that hurricane effect where, okay, I'm trying to record a video, but I could barely hear myself because the, the, the fans were so loud. 
and also it was complicated. It's like I had to learn these hot keys for switching between a camera pointing at me and the desktop or this window. And while it was very sophisticated, it felt like I was playing StarCraft. You know, like, eh, it's too complicated, too complicated. I don't want to mess with it. So now I'm just using QuickTime Player and I'm recording the screen. It's actually very high resolution, um, probably too high a resolution. So I end up processing that. But that, that seems to work well. The failure mode I had there in the beginning was you have to explicitly choose the microphone you're going to use. Um, and there were times I forgot to do that step and where it was using the built-in mic. And I'd listen to the audio, audio and it's like, what happened? You know, I really messed up the settings on my fancy mic. Well, it wasn't. I wasn't even using the fancy mic. So this is an advantage of doing a lot of videos and doing them often. So it used to be I'd make one or two videos a year, like for Fosdom. And it would take me like a week to record this one video. And, oh, okay, how do I do this? And how do I set up OBS? And what's the bit rate? And all that stuff. But... If I'm making two, three, four videos a day, you know, it's it, I, I know exactly what the setup is and I don't know exactly how I make mistakes for the common mistakes and I know what to check. You know, it's just, um, it's not a problem. And and each time I, I do something, I get, or maybe every 10 times I do something, I get a little better at it or I figure out some shortcut. So um, that's an advantage. There's also this software called Audacity, which is also... I don't know what the license is, either free or open source software uh, for audio editing. And you can do leveling of audio. You can do um, removing of background noise. Like I said, the fan noise, there's like a way to remove fan noise. And originally I was doing OBS and Audacity together. And if you're on GNU Linux, you know, that's maybe a great combination. I think you can get these on Linux. But I found it um, once again using Audacity you know, uh, sort of peg my uh, fans. Well, Final Cut Pro also does that. So, you know, it's not really Audacity's fault. Um, but for whatever reason, I could never get the audio quality to be very good. It, um, so I don't know. I just wasn't using it the right way, I guess. I'm not sure. But I, I stumbled around with that a lot. And also, I guess part of it was, you know, I was getting a bad input with all these fans, fan noises and that kind of thing and trying to process it later instead of just trying to get a clean input to begin with. Uh, so I think that was a lot of my problem. But anyway, I gave up on Audacity and OBS and I'm just trying to do it really simple, try to get the best input I could or I can. And then I do a little light Final Cut Pro um, level normalization, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, I'd prefer to not even do that, but at this point, I've got that down more or less. So um, it's not necessarily bad because, you know, I, I need to listen to at least a little bit of the audio of my final recording anyway, because I need to make sure I like, I didn't do something like use the wrong microphone like I did before. Uh, so I need to listen to my mic a little bit, make sure that something weird's not, I'm not picking up the buzz of a lamp or something. I just want to do a little spot check and also make sure that for whatever reason, the sound levels acceptable. Uh, so anyway, I use Final Cut Pro and I'll show you how I do that. Once again, I'm using a tiny for percentage of the, the actual features. I don't know how to use it very well, but I know how to use it a, a well enough to, to do a little bit of editing and the, the sound normalization for YouTube. And then there's, there's a software that comes with this mic, the MV7 called Sure Plus Motive. And every time I get a peripheral that has software, I'm like, uh-oh, this is probably going to be horrible. But this software is actually good. And the other part of it is because it's a, a, a dynamic mic and the sound level is so low, the loudness is so low by default, turns out you really need that setup in the software in order to get an acceptable sound level. Otherwise, you won't get enough amplification and all that. It's just It will just sound terrible. So... Uh, let me show you what the setup is. So first of all, I have it locked. Okay, so I'm going to unlock it. Now here's the software. And uh, you can do auto level using the presets, but forget that. We're going to use the manual. And uh, mic gain, turn it all the way up. Now normally, I was used to, you know, you don't ever turn the mic game all the way up. Oh yeah, 
you turn it all the way up, 36 dB, and you're still going to have to add probably 10 to 15 dB uh, to get a decent loudness in software after this. But you better better turn it all the way up, all the way up, okay? Um, the EQ, uh, I've got it flat. Actually, no, in the past, I th thought I had had a boost here. <laughs> I wonder if I just reset everything somehow. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see how this turns out. Uh, I thought I had the... Uh, well, maybe, I, so some of these things I turned off because I was doing some editing in Final Cut Pro. At one point, I was using this high pass and presence boost uh, with the full gain, and I also had a limiter on, but I now I'm using a limiter in the software, so probably I just turned that off. Uh, and I had the compressor. So I had these things on. You can use this. And if I were doing like a live stream, maybe I'd need to turn these things on, go, to, go here, turn this on, turn the compressor all the way up. And that gives you effectively a boost, um, but it's not ideal. Another failure mode I found was that somehow I was accidentally changing the mic gain. And sometimes it'd be like 33 dB instead of 36, and then that would kind of screw up the recording. So there is a little lock icon, so you can't change anything. So that's that's handy, and then you can hide it. So that's, that's what I do there. Hopefully I didn't screw up any of the, the settings. Um, Okay, so so that's the software for the mic. So let's, uh, you know, and like I said, I, I would use uh, QuickTime Player to record the, uh, but you can use it to record the audio. You can also use it to record the screen. You can also use it to record video, but I use it to record the screen with the MV7 uh, microphone. All right, so let's say, for example, that I have recorded a video already and I want to process it. So here's what I do. So let's, I don't know, let's go um, maybe look at this one. Okay, so here's a screen recording uh, January 30th. Okay, I don't remember which video that is, but I got an MOV file, Apple movie file. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up Final